Uh, okay, sir. Shall we start? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, everyone, uh, and good afternoon in UK. Uh, so it's my pleasure uh, to invite uh, our speaker, Dr. Uh, Ram, who is. Uh, I mean, he doesn't require an introduction. The name itself is an introduction. So I have been privileged to be have uh, sort of trained under him for a very short while. Uh, but uh, I mean, I think he is one of the best teachers across the world. So it was a pleasure to listen to you, Ram, especially in the morning at meetings. <laughs> and uh, your in COVID era will always be with me throughout my life. Uh, and uh, um, the chairperson today is uh, uh, Dr. Narayanan, who has been my mentor. Uh, so I have, I think I'm one of the most lucky students <laughs> uh, who has got the opportunity to learn under sir and still learning under sir. So I, when I get a difficult case, I call sir and he's always there to help me out. Uh, so thank you, sir, uh, for coming down. And uh, now I would request uh, Khalil, sir, to uh, uh, give a formal introduction to both the speaker and the chairperson, and then we will set the ball rolling. Yeah. Uh, good evening, one and all. I welcome you all on behalf of Ankura Group of uh, Children's Hospitals to this uh, uh, session on uh, pediatric inflammatory and multisystem inflammatory syndrome in children. So we have eminent uh, speaker today, uh, Dr. Padmanabhan uh, Ramnarayan, as a uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Nikhil pointed out, he, he doesn't need any introduction. He has contributed vastly uh, to the discipline of pediatric critical care, including uh, specifically the pediatric, uh, I mean, uh, transport, uh, transport of uh, critically ill children. Uh, Dr. Ram is an honorary consultant in pediatric intensive care, St. Mary's Hospital. He's an associate professor, uh, respiratory critical care and anesthesia, infection, immunity and inflammation department. University College of London, Great Ormond Street uh, Institute of Child Health. Uh, so uh, today we'll be uh, hearing from him about uh, the multi-system inflammatory syndrome uh, in children. So the chairing, uh, chairing this session would be uh, Dr. Narayanan uh, Parmeshwaran, uh, who is the head of uh, pediatrics and uh, pediatric critical care from the prestigious uh, JIPMAR. Uh, he is also trained in pediatric critical care from uh, RCH Melbourne. Uh, so, over to you, uh, uh, sir, for uh, for beginning this session. Thank you very much, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I will just quickly just share my slides just to make sure you can see them now. Is that okay? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so as um, Nikhil and uh, uh, York, um, have been requested to do this talk on pediatric inflammatory multisystem syndrome or PIMS, uh, which as you probably all know, we didn't even know 12 months ago and this condition didn't exist 12 months ago. And now uh, we are talking about it as if we know all about it um, in a very familiar way. So uh, this is an example of how rapidly we have learned about a condition, new condition and I think we can say probably that there are very few new conditions or new diagnoses that we have learned in our own lifetime from scratch. And this is one of them. Um, so as um, I was saying earlier, uh, that this condition is called by many names uh, in the US and in other parts of the world. Now it's called uh, MISC, which is Multisystem Inflammatory Syndrome in Children in the UK. The name uh, was uh, coined as PIMS, Pediatric Inflammatory Multisystem uh, Syndrome. So I just wanted to cover um, over the next, say, 40 minutes or so, uh, a few of these points. What is PIMS-TS? Uh, how does it present? What are the clinical features of its presentation? What is the differential diagnosis of a, a child who presents with um, something that looks like PIMS-TS? What are the outcomes of this condition? Because again, this is a new condition and we don't really know a lot about it. What do we know so far? And why do children get PIMS-TS? And I think this is a million dollar question that nobody really knows the exact answer to, but there's a lot of hot research um, in this area. Uh, and finally, I will cover the treatment um, options or the current sort of treatments people are uh, providing these children. 
So starting from PIMS DS, as I said, we didn't really know about this condition for um, you know less than a year ago now. And I'll give you a quick sort of um, timeline of how these things um, uh, went through. So this is the week of April 2020, um, the tw week of the 20th of April. And you see here that we've had now COVID in the UK from uh, around about sort of middle of March. A lockdown was initiated sometime on the 20th of March. Um, and so about a month into the lockdown, uh, we started seeing children presenting with some unexplained inflammatory features. Um, and as you can see here, we have a very active WhatsApp group uh, of pediatric intensive care um, specialists in the UK across the country. And you can see that this is a message that I sent to my colleagues um, on the 24th of April, the Friday, saying we are seeing several cases of previously well children with symptoms like this. Uh, and messages from other parts of the country came to say that they had been seeing similar patients as well. Um, and some of these kind of features, as you can see in the, in the messages, are quite true even um, now. So what's the timeline? So very quickly, um, remember that was the 26th, uh, 24th. By the 26th, which is Sunday, uh, two days later, the Pediatric Critical Care Society or the Pediatric Intensive Care Society at the time put out an urgent alert on Twitter um, warning that there were rising number of children presenting to pediatric ICUs with multi-system inflammation um, where there were overlapping features of toxic shock. This was um, in response to a res uh, an alert put out by NHS England um, the very same day after some conference calls. And literally within five days, four or five days of this, a group of pediatricians, uh, intensivists, infectious disease consultants, rheumatologists, um, and academics had got together. Um, and I was fortunate to be part of this group and listen into those discussions. Um, and the Royal College of Pediatrics put out a case definition. Now, I think it was really important at the time to put out a case definition because they, these were um, seemingly slightly different presentations that nobody had seen before. And if we wanted to capture information about this in a more systematic and standardized way, we needed a case definition. So what was discussed as a case definition at this time, remember this is the sort of end of April, beginning of May, not a lot of information was available. And this case definition hasn't really changed even after uh, several months of PIMS patients. So this is still the current RCPCH definition. Um, and it says, a child presenting with persistent fever, signs of inflammation and signs of single or multi-organ dysfunction, um, where there is no other obvious microbial cause, such as sepsis, staph or strep shock syndrome, or myocarditis. And these children may be positive by PCR testing for SARS-CoV-2 or negative um, by testing. At this point in time, in the beginning of May, there was really not that much availability of serology um, testing. And so therefore, there was no uh, impetus for us to put that into the definition. Um, you will see in the next slide that over the next week or two, the other definitions that emerged took some of that into account. So we'll see that next. Um, and the RCPCH said all stable children should be discussed as uh, soon as possible with specialist services, and there should be a low threshold for referral to pediatric intensive care using normal pathways. Um, very soon after this, literally five days after this, um, the very first published reports of this particular new condition came from Shelley Ripagan and colleagues in London, in South London. They'd seen eight children in the preceding week who all were antibody positive, but antigen negative or PCR negative for SARS-CoV-2. 90% of these patients were ventilated or required ventilation. 100% of them had presented in warm shock and had been treated with noradrenaline uh, and milrinone for cardiac dysfunction. Uh, and one child out of the eight had died. Um, and very soon after this, uh, literally within a week, the American CDC published a case definition for Miss C. Um, we'll come to that in the next slide. And very soon after that, three days after that, the French and the Swiss published this um, 
series of 35 children over two months um, who had presented with significant cardiac failure with a left ventricular ejection fraction of less than 30% in a third, 80% of patients needing inotropic support, and nearly one in three patients needed ECMO support. Um, now, in retrospect, when you look at this data, um, it seems like the use of ECMO was probably too much. Um, and it may be that this is a new condition that they were encountering. They weren't really able to um, kind of understand how to manage these children, um, you know, well from the very beginning. So now the current estimates are that, you know, not every child or not one in three children certainly need ECMO. Probably one in 20 children might need ECMO currently, um, as we've understood the disease a little bit more. But they all have significant cardiovascular dysfunction. And I think one of the problems at this stage was that this disease or this condition looked very similar to other conditions that we knew about, such as Kawasaki disease or macrophage activation or toxic shock syndrome or viral sepsis. So people who knew these conditions decided that this was one of those diseases. So the immunologists uh, decided that this was macrophage activation syndrome, or the rheumatologists decided this was macrophage activation syndrome. The infection specialists decided this was a new form of Kawasaki disease or an atypical presentation of Kawasaki disease. General pediatricians thought this was toxic shock syndrome or viral sepsis. So it's very difficult for people to pin this um, disease down. So here's a table that um, compares the various case definitions. Um, on the first column is the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, which we just looked at, the case definition. The Centers for C Disease Control, CDC from the US, published uh, a case definition, as I showed you. And I think two things are important to, um, to look at here on the CDC definition, which is quite similar to the WHO definition, which is on the third column. Essentially, persistent fever is a feature. Persistent fever is defined in the CDC definition of more than 24 hours. In the WHO definition, it's more than three days. And in the RCPCH definition, there isn't really a duration of temperature um, in the case definition. And that sort of illustrates how complicated trying to get a definition agreed um, was for this particular condition. Most patients that we see now and understand have PIMS have had temperature for over two or three days and high temperature for over two or three days. So I think we are looking more at a WHO type definition for fever. Signs of inflammation or lab markers of inflammation. Um, and you can see various biomarkers there, CRP, ESR, D-dimers, ferritin, LDH, IL-6. Um, everything has been looked at as a marker of inflammation. We'll come back to that later when we talk about the clinical presentation. Multi-system involvement, um, more than one organ system, particularly the heart, which is very commonly affected. Other pathologies are excluded, i.e. that it isn't obviously sepsis or staphylococcal toxic shock syndrome, um, and that there is some link to SARS-CoV-2. Now, in the RCPCH definition, a very non-specific um, line that says SARS-CoV-2 PCR may be positive or negative, but the CDC definition specifies that there should be antibody or PCR positivity or exposure history in the last four weeks to family members who had COVID. So there is some um, tighter uh, link to SARS-CoV-2 in that definition. The WHO definition is quite similar again to the um, CDC definition in making an explicit link to SARS-CoV-2 infection. The problem here um, is that, as you know now, COVID can be asymptomatic and in children particularly is more likely to be minimally symptomatic or asymptomatic. So therefore, um, having an exposure history in family members may be difficult to ascertain because many of them might not have had severe symptoms. Many of them have, may have mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. So trying to pin it down uh, epidemiologically to be a link to the SARS-CoV-2 infection is quite challenging. We've seen several children who are PCR negative, antibody positive, and have no reported contact with anybody in the family with um, uh, with um, SARS-CoV-2, but clearly they have had it. 
um, a few weeks ago. So moving on quickly to clinical features. Um, this is a sort of typical example of a non-specific presentation that might look like um, PIMS-TS. Um, this is a typical age group, an older child, nine-year-old, three days of fever, some GI symptoms, loose stools vomiting, non-specific abdominal pain. As I go into the further slides, you will see that GI symptoms are a very prominent feature of PIMS-TS. Um, airway is patent, a little bit tachypneic, well-saturated, not hypoxic, no respiratory distress, a bit tachycardic, and um, has some metabolic acidosis with a base deficit of minus nine and a lactate of 3.5. And a white cell count that is not very declarative, you know, it's not confirmatory of anything. The platelets are not terrible, and the CRP is uh, just over 100. So this is the sort of child that we started seeing the difficulty, as you can all see, is that this could be anything. This could be a child with sepsis. This could be a child with gastroenteritis. This could be a child with appendicitis. Um, this could be a child with any non-specific illness, including myocarditis and enteroviral infection. So very difficult to make out from here uh, whether this is PIMS-TS. So the very first publication the, um, of PIMS-TS patient cohort was um, from the London group. So we all published 58 children, description of 58 children with PIMS-TS um, that presented to London hospitals. Um, and you can see here that the median age group was nine in PIMS-TS patients. There was a significant race difference or ethnicity difference between white population uh, and black and Asian population. Is this because COVID as an infection is much higher in these ethnicity groups? Um, or is it because there is something else that's driving PIMS-TS to be more common in these groups? We don't really know. Looking at clinical features, GI symptoms, as I said, abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, and vomiting are common features. Over 50% of patients, these 58 patients had abdominal symptoms. There was also mucocutaneous symptoms, so rash, um, as well as mucous membrane changes and conjunctival um, redness. You can see that that's, again, close to 50% of the patients had rash, conjunctival injection, and some with mucous membrane changes. Nearly half had shock, um, and only 20% had respiratory symptoms. And this is different from what you would expect to see in acute COVID infection, where if you went by the adult phenotype, there would be a predominant respiratory um, presentation. Um, the intensivists got together in the UK and we described the first series of 78 patients with PIMS-DS admitted to intensive care units across the UK. So uh, you can see here that um, that sort of typifies what we just talked about, which is the age group that's most at risk is the over five uh, in fact, the 11 to 15 year old. Um, we also observed in this cohort that the median observed to expected weight ratio was 1.22. So these were all slightly larger children um, than expected, i.e. heavier and uh, more likely to be obese. Um, most of them did not have any previous comorbidities. They were previously well children. And again, the race and the ethnicity differences are obvious here. Um, in, in this slide. Um, intensive care cohort, you can see that shock was the main reason for admission to ICU. So 87% had shock when they were admitted to ICU. Most of them were in vasodilatory or warm shock, and some were in vasoconstricted cold shock. This is an excellent systematic review. If you haven't seen it, it's not very, very new. It's uh, September, October time from 2020. Um, it's a sign of the times that if I say something from September, October is old, uh, that you understand what I mean. In previous to COVID, when we said something was from September, October 2020, we would say that was the latest evidence. We wouldn't say that about any of this anymore. But this is a really good systematic review. You can see 39 studies were included in it. 662 uh, MISC or PIMS-TS patients were included. And the bottom line points are, it's an older age group presentation, nine years as a mean persistent fever, nearly three quarters of these patients had GI symptoms. So really important to watch out for these patients. A child with a fever, persistent fever with GI symptoms, abdominal pain, vomiting, 
diarrhea um, in this context is quite likely to have PIMS TS. Um, you can see rash and conjunctivitis is, is over 50% um, of the cases had that. This is the um, New England Journal paper reporting the US experience of MISC patients. Uh, and you can see here that most of the patients, this high likelihood of gastrointestinal um, involvement, and then cardiac involvement, and then hematological involvement, then mucocutaneous involvement, respiratory involvement. So you can see that the common symptoms as you go down uh, start from gastrointestinal and, and sort of respiratory is not that common. Vasodilated picture with hypotension and warm shock is the predominant presentation. And it's usually fluid refractory or minimally re uh, responsive to fluid, but it is vasopressor responsive as warm shock you would expect uh, would be. Adrenaline or noradrenaline are the um, vasopressor inotrope of choice, and we'll go into that um, in uh, more detail as we go along. Um, so looking at the systematic review and looking at lab markers, you can see here, these are the summary points. Many of these patients are lymphopenic, very significantly lymphopenic under one. They are hypoalbuminemic. They have transaminitis. They have some degree of acute kidney injury. They have a significant elevation in CRP mean value in this systematic review, 160. A ferritin that's elevated, a hyperferritinemic picture with a mean of about 1,000. D-dimers indicating some procoagulant um, presentations, um, indicating significantly high D-dimers um, with procoagulation and fibr fibr fibrin degradation products. Um, looking at cardiac biomarkers, majority of patients have significantly elevated troponin. The mean is 500, and you can see the normal is under 10. And the BNP, a sign of um, heart failure, mean of 3,600 with a normal of less than 100. So these patients have significant inflammatory picture as well as cardiac biomarker um, dysfunction. What about chest X-ray findings? Most of them, 50% of them are, un, uh, are likely to be abnormal. They're usually indicative of fluid in the lungs, um, even if it's a mild amount of fluid with some inflammation of the airways um, evidence. So, uh, sorry, lung inflammation with um, leaking of, of, blood, of uh, uh, fluid into the lungs. And there's evolving fluid overload and pulmonary edema um, as a clinical presentation as time goes by, particularly when the heart failure becomes more prominent. What about GI presentations? As I said, these are very common presentations, and this is a case series from the very beginning, as you can see sometime in early, uh, mid-May. These are patients, eight patients with uh, ultrasound changes of mesenteric lymphadenopathy and thickened terminal ileum, so terminal ileitis, uh, with significant uh, thickening and, and edema uh, is a co common feature. Um, and using abdominal CT, 90% uh, of them will be abnormal. There will be some free fluid, there might be some bowel wall thickening, there might be some mesenteric lymphadenopathy. We talked about the terminal ileitis. And the main problem here is that it looks very much like it could be appendicitis. Um, but in 75% of the cases, CT imaging does help to distinguish between acute appendicitis and PIMS-TS. And so I think it's worth doing if there is any doubt about whether the child has appendicitis. So there have been several cases across the world um, of laparotomies being performed in these children uh, with a negative finding. Um, so no appendicitis when they do a laparotomy, but have been taken and had surgery um, because they present very, very similar to acute appendicitis. Um, echo findings, um, mainly depressed LV function is quite common. 50% uh, of patients have abnormal cardiac echoes. There's also more significant diastolic dysfunction. Relaxation of the heart is impaired. It recovers more slowly. There are potentially uh, a likelihood of pleural and pericardial effusions. And coronary artery changes are the most important finding that everyone's obviously concerned about. They can range from brightness, just brightness, to dilatation, to aneurysmal dilatation. Uh, and when we talk about aneurysmal dilatation, these are uh, significantly dilated. Um, and as you know, there are um, standard, uh, there are normative values for coronary arteries and dimensions. 
um, and these are over three standard deviations um, dilated. Eight to 10% appeared uh, to have coronary aneurysms um, in the early case series, and that sort of number holds out roughly uh, even currently. So looking at differential uh, diagnosis, well, we know that these are the sort of conditions that we worry about, and they look like um, these conditions. Um, what we showed in our intensive care cohort is that um, this is obviously very early on, but we showed that this is the line showing the cumulative number of PIMS DS patients. Um, and you can see that these is week by week number of patients admitted with PIMS DS. And these blue lines are the combined admissions of all the other inflammatory conditions like Kawasaki disease, toxic shock syndrome, macrophage activation, and HLH. Um, in the previous five years. So you can see that this is not one of those conditions. This is a different problem. Uh, this is not exactly the same as what we had in the past. So what about, um, can we tell from the data that we have uh, published whether there are some differences between other conditions and PIMS-DS? So you can see here that elevated inflammatory markers like CRP, uh, etc. are very clearly much higher in PIMS-DS um, compared to other conditions. But when you talk about comparing them, there is overlap and it's very difficult to say, unless the number is 400, um, that it's very difficult to say that that is abnormal or very abnormal. Um, you can see hyperferritinemia is definitely a marker of uh, PIMS-DS compared to say Kawasaki disease or Kawasaki disease shock syndrome. Troponin, uh, again, significantly elevated compared to other diseases, but again, significant overlap. So it's very difficult by one test to be able to tell whether that this is PIMS-DS or not. Procoagulant state D-dimer, um, you can see again, significantly elevated in PIMS-DS compared to say Kawasaki disease and Kawasaki shock. So just quickly sort of running through a summary uh, of what we found uh, in the literature by sort of August time. This is the US CDC data. Uh, and what they did in August was to look at all their cases and divided them into three classes or three different types. So there were 570 patients included in this analysis. So when they did a cluster analysis, they found that one class was the classic PIMS type phenotype. The second class was more like an acute COVID infection phenotype. And the third class was more like Kawasaki disease, so more mucous membrane and skin involvement. You can see here that, that this is the Kawasaki disease, exactly the, the classic Kawasaki disease um, phenotype. And you can see here the differences. Um, the Kawasaki disease is a young child's problem rather than an older child's problem. And PIMS-DS is much more an older child um, disease than a younger child's disease. Um, SARS-CoV PCR is positive in acute COVID, but very, very infrequently positive in classic PIMS-DS. Abdominal pain, very common. Shock, very common. ARDS, much less common, so not much respiratory involvement. Um, I'll skip through this. Um, echo findings. This is a um, comparison of MIS-C or PIMS-DS with control population and classic Kawasaki disease. And you can see that presence of pleural effusions and significantly impaired left ventricular ejection fraction were characteristic of PIMS-DS uh, and which helped you to distinguish between classic Kawasaki patients um, from these patients. The surviving sepsis campaign published this paper uh, in pediatric critical care medicine just to summarize how you would distinguish sepsis from PIMS-DS. And the bottom line is that respiratory symptoms are uncommon in PIMS-DS, but much, likely, much more likely in our experience. Um, pneumonia sepsis is much more likely from previous um, experience. So uh, PIMS-DS doesn't usually present with respiratory problems. GI problems much more common in PIMS-DS and rash and conjunctival redness much more common. Severe lymphopenia, as I said earlier, is common. Thrombocytopenia is less common compared to sepsis, where you would expect most children with sepsis to be thrombocytopenic. Hyperferritinemia is much, much more common, much higher values uh, here than in sepsis. Uh, 
Um, we had a, a, a discussion earlier about distinguishing PIMS DS patients, which is a post COVID situation from the acute COVID infection. Now you can see here that just ignore this bit, but the fever is much more marked. Diarrhea is much more marked. Vomiting, rash are much more marked in PIMS DS compared to acute COVID and cough which is a respiratory symptom, and rhinorrhea, which is a respiratory symptom, much more likely in acute COVID than in um, PIMS-DS. Um, you may have seen this paper that was published last week or week, literally a week ago, so 24th of February, um, from the US CDC, where they compared 539 cases of PIMS-DS with 577 cases of severe acute COVID in children. Um, so big, large data sets. This was in the JAMA last week. Um, and you can see here, that it's more likely to be PIMS-DS if you were in the six to 12 age group. Um, it was much more likely to be PIMS-DS if your ethnicity in the, in the US population here is non-Hispanic black population. Much more likely to be COVID if you had underlying pre-existing medical conditions um, as opposed to PIMS-DS, which is more common in children with no previous comorbidities or previous conditions. Um, so the sorts of patients that we've seen here with acute COVID respiratory infections are children with multi, uh, multiple comorbidities, such as cerebral palsy, uh, developmental delay, genetic syndromes, uh, immunodepression, immunosuppression, et cetera. So just looking at laboratory values and clinical phenotypes, you can see again from this paper from last week that it's more likely to be COVID uh, with respiratory, more likely to be PIMS if you had um, many other features such as cardiorespiratory involvement uh, and cardiovascular, so shock, uh, mucocutaneous involvement, a high neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio reflecting the absolute lymphopenia that happens uh, in PIMS-DS. Low platelets, high CRP greater than 100, more likely to be PIMS-DS. So, um, so very quickly coming on to outcomes, uh, what do we know so far? So this is um, some data we described from the ICUs in the UK. You can see at the time in the 78 patients, three patients needed ECMO, so 4% needed ECMO. 92% um, had had a fluid bolus and 83% received an inotropic uh, or vas vasopressor infusion. Uh, one patient needed renal replacement therapy, the same patient who was also on ECMO. Most of these patients were uh, managed in various forms of respiratory support, so only about 50% were invasively ventilated. And what we saw in the UK cohort, the ICU cohort, is that the rate of IMV fell over time Whereas the first week of presentation, most of these children were ventilated. By the end of the um, data collection period of six weeks in May, most of these children were not ventilated. People were uh, finding ways to ca support cardiovascular system without intubating and ventilating these patients. Um, so the rate of vasoactive support remained exactly the same throughout the six week period we looked at. And the rate of invasive ventilation fell over time. And that's reflected in our current practice where it is extremely unlikely now to have to ventilate um, a patient with PIMS-DS. Most of them are managed um, awake, self-ventilating. Um, they stay in hospital um, roughly five days in ICU and about eight days in the hospital. So that's sort of holds still. This is data from the um, systematic review I talked about earlier. 70% uh, roughly the same, maybe 60 odd percent now need ICU admission, 60 percent have shock and therefore need shock management. Most of them will need vasoactive support, uh, aneurysmal dilatation in about 8 percent um, of patients and coronary artery dilatation of prominence in about 7.6, so about 15 percent uh, coronary abnormalities. Uh, also important to note that left ventricular function is com uh, dysfunction is common about five, uh, 50% of the patients. So it's interesting to see this latest JAMA article, which is now the first article that's described a huge cohort, a large cohort with longer term outcomes up to 40 days. And you can see that the proportion of patients that went from having ventricular dysfunction to normal ventricular function very quickly and got better. So this left ventricular ejection fraction got better very, very quickly. So 
60% of the patients with uh, were back to over 55% ejection fraction within five days. Um, and this is basically the, the groups, the blue, the orange, and the light blue are the patients who started uh, in these various um, states. So you can see that the very severely affected patients, so the ejection fraction was less than 35% um, when they started, normalized and became sort of uh, over 55 in 80% of the patients within seven days. So within a week, most of them had recovered. As well as coronary artery aneurysms, you can see here that uh, aneurysms resolved on echocardiography in 80% of the patients by six weeks. So this is 40 days by six weeks. You can see here that 80% um, of them had resolved their coronary artery um, uh, dilatation. So most of these patients have completely resolved their cardiovascular changes. Um, I realize I've got another uh, 10 minutes to talk and then we should have lots of questions hopefully. Um, so I'll try and cover in two or three slides why some children seem to get PIMS-TS and others don't. And I think there is, um, it is still unclear, uh, but there are some clues in what we know. The first thing is that even though we call PIMS-TS a post-COVID inflammatory state, the PCR is positive in 20 to 40% of cases. So there is active virus in 20 to 40% of cases. SARS antibodies are positive in 90 plus percent of PCR positive cases. So what this essentially shows you is that they are PCR positive, but they also have antibody, which means that they have been PCR positive for some time and their antibody uh, production has started. So they probably have had this for some time. So there's a clue here to think about, and this is an active area of research, is to whether these are children who are not able to completely clear SARS-CoV-2 uh, very quickly like other children might do. And so therefore, you know, a couple of weeks, three weeks, four weeks into the infection are still harboring some virus and therefore they are PCR positive, but they also have started developing or producing antibodies. So um, in PCR negative cases, i.e. no active P um, COVID infection, SARS-CoV uh, SARS antibody is positive in 96%. So most of these patients are now previously uh, infected patients. Um, so what that tells you is that there are probably two groups of children here. One set may be children who get the um, COVID infection and are unable to clear it effectively very quickly, or that their antibody production is quite rapid uh, and overlaps significantly with the acute infection and that there's a second group of patients where they are PCR negative, where the antibody is positive in 96%, so they had it a few weeks ago. Um, there is some active doubt whether PCR negativity in this context means that it is still there, it's just that you can't find it. Um, and there is some intriguing research going on, which I'll show you um, very quickly. But I think what is the key thing to note is that these are blue line representing SARS-CoV-2 cases in, uh, this is the US cohort. These are total population SARS-CoV infection. Um, starts going up somewhere in middle of March, but the MISC or the PIMS-TS patients are peaking at about a month later, four weeks to five weeks after the peak of acute adults and children being infected. And this phenomenon has been replicated in most of the cohorts and countries that published data has come from uh, that Miss C or PIMS-TS is running roughly four to five weeks behind acute population COVID infection. Um, this is a very busy slide and I won't go too much into the detail of it, um, but essentially, as I said, is this post-infectious or is it a, um, sorry, um, a persistent infection that is unable to be cleared by the individual? We don't know yet. What we do know is that there is an intense inflammation when there is PIMS-TS. You can see here significantly elevated IL-6, IL-8 um, uh, proportions or, or concentrations. Uh, there is a differential B and T cell subset lymphopenia, which is what we see when we do the uh, total lymphocyte count. And the immunopathology of this is very different from Kawasaki disease, uh, which is uh, clearly and well understood from previous studies. So um, reaching the final part of our talk about treatment, so 
patients are referred to critical care mainly because they are in shock. Um, they are usually in vasodilated, but also have cardiogenic shock from LV dysfunction. Um, it's very difficult to know which patients have cardiogenic shock unless you have an echo. Um, uh, and as I said, 50% will have left ventricular um, dysfunction. The diagnosis of ruling, uh, after ruling out the other obvious causes like septic shock, viral myocarditis, toxic shock syndrome, which can be quite difficult. If you rule these out, then you're left uh, with PIMS-TS. And in this situation, the acute management is cautious fluid resuscitation. This is not the septic patient where you would put a lot of fluid in um, to resuscitate, and resuscitate them. They are less likely to respond to fluid and in fact respond badly to fluid. Um, so 10 liters, 10 mils per kilo rather than 20 mils per kilo um, as a bolus, probably even five mils per kilo to start with. Assess for signs of fluid overload, tachypnea, oxygen requirement, hepatomegaly, crackles are all signs that these patients are getting fluid overloaded. As I said, the chest x-ray does give you a clue about pulmonary edema, uh, and you can probably check on if you're experienced with lung ultrasound or with chest x-rays. Um, that there is evolving fluid overload. Early vasoactive medications or peripheral, or in many situations when the child is quite sick uh, and shocked, uh, intraosseous as a quick access point to start some adrenaline or noradrenaline, um, 0.1 to 0.2 mics per kilo per minute. Our current practice is to start peripheral because many of these, most of these children are older children. You can get a good line and start some peripheral adrenaline or noradrenaline, and both have been shown to be safe uh, in these patients to be administered peripherally. We've got a case series now of about 35 children, even 40 odd children with noradrenaline started peripherally, and uh, it seems to work without any safety concerns um, because most of these patients are in uh, vasodilated shock. The alternative would be to intubate them and put central lines in, etc., which is much more invasive <coughs> and it's probably not necessary. Um, fine tuning of the vasoactive medications could then become your next step. Um, so you become, uh, you put your adrenaline or your noradrenaline centrally. Uh, milrinone, if echo confirms LV dysfunction, uh, it, it, obviously, if you have the ability to not hypotensive and you have the cover of the noradrenaline. Um, so the management of this condition is, is clearly um, multidisciplinary, not pick you alone, but clearly many other teams might be involved, cardiology, ID, immunology, rheumatology, et cetera. Um, and in this systematic review that I showed you earlier, the vast majority of patients, 75% odd, had received IVIG. Um, and IVIG is given to these children on the belief that it works like it would work in Kawasaki disease. That's where this comes from, or in toxic shock syndrome. Um, and that's why IVIG has become quite common. Corticosteroids, uh, again, 50 plus percent were given corticosteroids, again, on the belief that this is an immunomodulatory treatment for this condition. We found in our UK review from last year that in the first week, nobody really knew what to give. Uh, these are the numbers of cases, as you can see, they kind of go up and come down by May. But you can see here that the number of patients receiving intravenous IVIG starts from about a third to nearly 100% by the end of this period. The patients receiving steroids goes up from 50% to nearly 100% by the end of this period. And patients receiving antiplatelet treatment with aspirin goes rockets up to 100%. Why did this happen? Well, because nobody really knows what the right treatment is. And by the time people started talking to each other by sort of this stage, everybody was talking to each other and saying, I'm giving IVIG, I'm giving steroids, I'm giving aspirin. So everybody else gave aspirin and steroids and IVIG. And by the time you got to the end of this May period, everybody was giving, given um, steroids and IVIG um, and antiplatelet agents. So there was obviously some urgent need for uh, a consensus-based management pathway. There is no clear evidence-based pathway because we don't have any RCT evidence in this condition. Um, you can see here, results of a national Delphi process that we did in the UK, uh, which sort of goes like this. Uh, first line management is with IVIG, two gram per kilo. Uh, if the child is very young, i.e. under one year, and or has coronary artery aneurysms on presentation, then steroids are added in for synergistic immunomodulatory treatment. 
the second line would be uh, if you started with IVIG, you would get uh, IV methylpred, and that be usually after 24 hours of uh, review to see if the child is getting better. And if they haven't got better, you give them some steroids, usually pulse methylpred is along 10 to 30 milligram per kilo. And then third line therapy with biologics, with tocilizumab or infliximab. So IL-6 blockade with tocilizumab um, is, as you know, is becoming obviously recognized part of treatment for adult COVID, uh, but we don't know exactly what it does in children with PIMS-DS yet. In the UK, as you probably all know, there's a very large trial called the recovery trial going on in adults, uh, has recruited over 35,000 patients. Um, there is now a part of recovery that has pediatric patients with PIMS-DS can be enrolled into. Um, and they have randomization for these patients that uh, either offers no additional treatment, i.e. none of the immunomodulators, or azithromycin, or corticosteroids, or IVIG. And the beauty of recovery is that you can go into this randomization even after having received something. So if you had received corticosteroids already, you can then be randomized to nothing uh, versus IVIG. Um, at that point. Um, so far, about 200 patients, pediatric patients with PIMS have been recruited into UK recovery trial. Uh, we don't have any results yet, and hopefully we will get something. But when you're talking about numbers, you know, the adult trials are looking at 7,000, 10,000 patients. We are talking about 200 patients. So I'm not really sure we'll find something um, stonking important uh, findings uh, from our numbers, but let's see. Um, but in the meantime, there are observational studies, and you can see this was published about four weeks ago in JAMA, uh, and this is the French group who published the comparison of IVIG plus steroids versus IVIG alone uh, in MISC, but the primary outcome was uh, fever or resolution of fever within 48 hours. Um, and you can see here that they found that giving IVIG and methylprednisolone uh, as the sort of combined treatment uh, versus IVIG alone uh, was much more effective um, from, the, from their perspective. Um, there has been a lot of criticism about this um, observational study. The numbers are quite big uh, or relatively big compared to what you would normally see in case series, but uh, the outcome of resolution of temperature within 48 hours uh, is not something that we would be very keen uh, to treat as a primary outcome. I think everybody knows, particularly, I'm sure you all know in India, that giving steroids does bring the temperature down quickly. So uh, you can give temperature to uh, steroids to a child with fever and the temperature will come down. So whether that is the right primary outcome to have looked at, should they have looked at something else like length of stay or uh, inotrope requirement, et cetera, et cetera, is a big question mark. So we don't really know whether we can use this data um, to guide our practice, but it does seem like giving dual therapy rather than single IVIG therapy might have some benefits. Uh, we don't know. We'll wait to find out. Other part of the treatment that um, is not usually covered a lot, uh, but is very important, is anticoagulation. Most of these patients are procoagulant, uh, and the uh, complications that we've seen in PIMS-DS patients are mostly thrombotic complications, either DVTs or pulmonary embolism. And so therefore, prophylactic anticoagulation is um, quite commonly used, and in fact now is part of the guideline that we use in the UK. Uh, again, very little evidence to support it, but that is what uh, we are doing. So I'll finish there, um, and the summary is that this is a novel syndrome that we discovered, uh, started in sort of April time with the advent of COVID. There are various case definitions, but they all roughly talk about the same sort of thing. There are similarities with many previous diseases like Kawasaki, toxic shock, et cetera, but it is definitely a distinct disorder. It's not one of these conditions. And the common features or the distinct features are intense inflammation, older age group, prominent GI symptoms, and some sort of link to SARS-CoV-2. The reason it's important to us intensive, intensive care consultants and, and physicians is that there is a high rate of PICU admission uh, for these conditions for these patients. So as opposed to uh, many other conditions, nearly 70% of these, 80% of these patients will come into the PICU, even if it's for a brief period of time, and receive vasoactive medications. We don't really know why it happens, 
but we do know that immunomodulatory treatments are uh, of some benefit. Uh, exactly how much benefit? It's not very clear. We don't really also know whether we should be giving IVIG and steroids or just IVIG alone as the first line treatment uh, and then reserve steroids for the next step uh, if they don't respond to IVIG and then biologics as your um, sort of third step uh, along the treatment pathway. So hopefully that was a very quick run through summary talk um, on PIMS DS. I'm very happy to take questions and uh, I think there are some questions, I haven't read them. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for that lucid and a very informative presentation. Uh, before we uh, take up the questions, I would like to request Dr. Narayanan, sir, uh, to share his experience in treating uh, these children in the Indian context. And at the same time, after his, uh, after his uh, I mean, brief deliberation, also to take up the questions and uh, address it to the speaker. Over to you, Narayanan, sir. Uh, hello. Hi. Yeah. Uh... <clears throat> Th uh, thanks, Ram, for that uh, elaborate and lucid uh, presentation. Yeah, as you mentioned, uh, uh, the confusion, we also had a, a quite a number of uh, patients. Uh, the, one of the issues uh, which we faced was things in our area, tropical infections are very common, like carp typhus and so many other infections. Uh, we had you know, a little bit of uh, confusion regarding uh, the diagnosis in the early stages. Like a lot of our patients, uh, because there was an enthusiasm to diagnose this, I felt that there was a certain amount of overdiagnosis initially. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, uh, one of our patients recent, a uh, few months back, uh, we treated like PIMS TS and after she got out of the ICU, uh, somebody noticed that she had an abscess, just for cellular disease, I had an abscess and actually it was looking like now a toxic Fox syndrome. So, uh, but as you said, the, uh, most of the features, what you mentioned, our experience has been quite similar. Uh, like more than 50% of them ended up in the ICU. They had uh, prominent GA symptoms and uh, rash and significant myocardial dysfunction. Yeah. And uh, even though initially we used to, uh, we, I, used to I used to tell the, this, uh, my uh, students and you know, colleagues that these are, these are similar in diseases that we used to see before, the dengue like illness and you know, viral symptoms of plastic shock syndrome. But the numbers were dramatically higher than what we used to see before. So that made us really believe that it's a new disease. Uh, and I also, even though uh, many of our colleagues in Chennai were treating them more with steroids than less with IVAG, uh, we actually gave them the most patients IVAG and we found that the response was quite good. In fact, uh, very few patients we are given both. In most patients we are happy with the IVAG alone and they showed a significant improvement within 24 to 48 hours. And only a couple of patients or maybe less than five we ended up giving steroids in addition to that after that. So that's been our experience. But of course, the biggest challenge was uh, picking up these diseases from the other common conditions, which are much more common in a tropical country like India compared to maybe UK or the US. And I think for that, uh, what we uh, found was that you know, the high levels of inflammatory markers. The issue was that we never used to check this ferritin or other things with the previously, you know, when the uh, child with uh, toxic shock syndrome comes or something. So we don't know how high they were before. So now we start checking them and we find that they're very high. And when in those children, in these markers were not very high, like CRP is just a, say around 5, 10, 30, or you know, ferritin was less than 500. Even though they have the look of PIPS, uh, TS, we think that it's not. And then you know, uh, that's what we are we're doing. And finally, it turned out to be some crap type or something else after a few days. Yeah, that's been our experience. There are a couple of quite questions. Maybe I think I should, uh, you know, uh, address them to you. Uh, I think one of the questions asked by uh, Dr. Hebala is, "What is the most reliable laboratory investigation or marker that raises suspicion of uh, PIMS TS?" I think it's difficult to answer with one uh, one marker because I think, as you say, exactly this. We all of us, I suppose, having the same problem is that if you use one or two markers, you end up over diagnosing the condition. And then you miss some of the important other conditions that are different, you know. Treatment. So in the middle of all the appendicitis-like problems, there are also true appendicitis that people have missed. Appendiceal abscesses have been uh, formed because people have missed a perforated appendix because they think it's a PIMS DS, uh, and the other way around, uh, people who have got you know other conditions. So I suppose the short answer is there isn't one test or one marker. I think it's a combination of uh, inflammatory markers. I think one thing I can say is that if the CRP is over 200, 
and there is no obvious septic um, presentation that you can see, i.e., you know, there's no pneumonia on the chest X-ray, there is no rash or uh, soft tissue infection or osteomyelitis or something obvious. Uh, I, in the current context of COVID infections in the community, I think um, that's definitely a high CRP of over 200 would make the suspicion go up quite significantly. But that's been our experience so so. Yeah, uh, Santi has asked another question. Is there any studies which showing arthritis as a part of uh, MISC? What's been your I'm not sure. I haven't seen any arthritis. We have seen um, slightly different uh, features recently, encephalopathic presentations. So uh, patients who are more encephalopathic than for the shock that you think they are. Um, encephalopathic for so even after treating the shock and the shock reversal they are more encephalopathic so there's some neurological type presentation there have been some testicular pain patients about seven patients we want we're writing them up now patients presenting solely with pims ds like features but testicular pain as their predominant symptom i'm not entirely sure why that um, is but arthritis i haven't seen any i don't know if anyone else has seen any arthritis no, even uh, we never uh, saw any arthritis. Yeah. Like you said, encephalopathy has been reported by many of our colleagues, even though we saw only one child which, in which we felt that there is some kind of amount of encephalopathy. It is out of proportion. Yeah. And Dr. Shankar has asked an interesting question. He asked whether he, have, he has a three day old baby with uh, SGA, severe thrombocytopenia, IVH, and having CCF. Mother was COVID positive one month prior to delivery. Is it MIS? So basically, he's asking whether maternal COVID uh, no, antibodies can le lead to something like this in a baby newborn. It's very difficult. I don't think anybody knows it, uh, the mechanisms. I suppose it is not simply the clearly the children have had the infection, active infection at some point in the past. So this baby should have been actively infected transplacentally and then and become inflamed in the way that we would expect. So um, I suppose from a workup point of view, it'd be very useful to do serology um, to see if this baby is serology positive. I suppose the antibodies might have come from the mother. So that's a problem to, uh, you know, to worry about, but also to do the inflammatory markers and see if there's any uh, inflammatory marker elevation. But I think newborn MISC or a newborn PIMS DS is almost rare to, I haven't seen a neonatal case yet, but I presume it may happen, but we don't know. Yeah, true. Yeah, uh, another question by somebody anonymous, yeah. I say DDAM is quite high in these patients and a prophylactic is started on anoxaparin and aspirin. Have you seen any thrombotic complication in the age group due to high d diver and duration of the anti in these patients? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the question, I suppose, have we seen any thrombotic complications? Yes, I think uh, there have been several, probably five to six at least, that are significant big thrombo thrombotic complications. Uh, two or three of them have been PEs. Uh, one of them was extensive, almost all big vessels uh, were thrombosed. Um, and another child had significant cerebro, cerebrovascular um, thrombus, uh, thromboembolic uh, stroke. Uh, and that was the child that we know died uh, from the national cohort. Um, so there are significant thrombotic complications. Uh, whether they are prevented by giving aspirin and enoxaparin, I don't know because there's no clear evidence one way or the other, but practice currently is that everybody gets it. Um, and usually they get it for about two weeks. Uh, and then people stop, unless they, of course, have a thrombotic complication. Um, so, the, so I don't know what you're doing currently. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, we've been using aspirin for almost everyone, and maybe enoxaparin not so. Are you using both for everybody? Both. Um, enoxaparin. enoxaparin definitely uh, for hundred percent of the patients. Mm -hmm. Aspirin is a little bit more um, variable, shall we say? Maybe. 20 to 30% of patients are getting aspirin, but also the more Kawasaki-like presentation, skin and mucous, mucous membrane changes patients uh, get high dose aspirin. So that's 30 to 50 milligram kilo per day. 
Uh, many of the others are getting low dose aspirin, so three to five um, milligram per kilo per day. So uh, probably about a third of the patients are getting aspirin in one form or the other, one dose or the other. Okay, yeah. Dr. Gauri has asked whether there is any specific reason for using mildenone and why can't they use dobutamine in these patients? We haven't used dobutamine because of the tachycardia. Usually most of these patients are very tachycardic. Um, they are hot. Usually they're hyper um, febrile, they're like 39, 40 degrees. They're usually very tachycardic. Um, they're also very tachypneic. So the classic sort of SERS definition that we know, systemic inflammatory response syndrome definition, we know includes tachycardia, tachypnea. And you see this very clearly in these patients. They don't have any respiratory problems, but they are tachypneic because they are very inflamed. They're very hot. Uh, they're also very tachycardic. And so I suppose in that setting, using dobutamine may well cause more tachycardia. Um, and that's why we don't use it. Uh, Mildenon after an echo uh, would obviously cause less tachycardia uh, and would obviously be in conjunction with noradrenaline. Yeah, Dr. Anil has asked whether there is any particular reason why GA tract is involvement is more common. I don't think nobody, uh, I don't think anybody knows the answer exactly. One of the postulated mechanisms is that clear, as you probably know, the ACE receptor is the primary mechanism by which the virus enters the body. Um, in respiratory tract, ACE, ACE um, uh, receptors are common, but the less, the most, less, sorry, the second most common place where there are ACE receptors is the GIT, um, the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and there are some hypothesized mechanisms that children are uh, less likely to have ACE receptors in the respiratory tract and more common to have res ACE receptors in the GIT. And therefore their presentation is much more GIT focused rather than respiratory tract focused. Um, there's some evidence, some lab evidence for that um, emerging. And in fact, in adults with COVID, persistent GIT involvement is, has been reported. In fact, stool samples, fecal samples from adults with COVID has demonstrated COVID in stool persistent um, for several days, several weeks sometimes, um, and gut biopsies have shown COVID particles in many of the PIMS-DS patients. Good. Yeah, uh, other question is, is there any, uh, no, is there any pattern of investigating? Is the first line, second line investigation is there, or do we do everything at the when this patient is suspected of PMS. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think the current practice is that if you think clinically that they have PIMS ts you send effectively all the tests we talked about. So the ferritin, the D-dimers, the um, CRP, the troponin, the BNP, the LDH, and obviously a full blood count and uh, urea and electrolytes. Um, I mean, I think that is currently what we are doing because I suppose the difficulty is without sending those, not one test is going to be diagnostic. So if you send some and they are not abnormal, it doesn't mean that they don't have it. And so it's very difficult. I don't know what you're doing. Are you prioritizing your blood tests, uh, Narayanan and others? Yeah, but uh, we are doing the basic inflammatory markers as soon as we suspect. And then of course, uh, like ferritin and CRP and uh, this and the COVID test, of course, and then subsequently followed by what all the systems we are identifying linking and going around. Of course, the D dimer and other things also are part of it, like LFT, RFT. After that, we chase the organs. And maybe uh, if we find the fevers are not responding and planning our second line things, I may repeat the uh, inflammatory marker. Yeah. I don't know what others are doing. Dr. Khalil? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's think. But that's fine. Yeah, so uh, uh, there's an interesting question by from Dr. Hebala again. Uh, MAC could happen with the reinfection or let's say on reactivation of the virus. You're asking that. So what's your question? I don't really that? know, I think. I don't know if anyone knows. Um, reinfection in COVID is itself is quite rare, as you know. I think the current estimate is less than 0.1% get reinfected. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't really know if it will happen again on reinfection. It's a good question. It's interesting that um, 
most of the pims ts patients if you ask them a history nobody the children nobody remembers having been unwell they all become unwell when they have pims ts but they never usually report anybody being unwell one question i always have wondered is why doesn't the child who is unwell with covid respiratory leak you know unwell ever get pims i have never seen a child who says i was unwell with covid with a lot of you know respiratory symptoms 4 weeks ago and now i have got pims ts it's always the child who's never ever had any symptoms <laughs> who gets pims ts so there must be some immunological mechanism yeah and as you mentioned we also noticed that uh, you know such obese children are getting this because usually in our icu in the we hardly get any obese children but during pims ts we had quite a few This is a bit odd. Uh, that we also observed. Is that that only common with common with yes, you know, you mentioned that we also saw. Otherwise, they are perfectly normal kids. Uh, we never had any history of COVID or anywhere near COVID. They never had any respiratory symptom. Even the family, uh, most of them had, did not report any COVID-related uh, admission, recovery admissions or symptoms. Quite strange. What is the mortality rate in PIMS TS? Doctor Arilar asked. yeah i mean i think the latest sort of uh cases you know the jama case series uh, reports a mortality of under 3% i think um most of the deaths are related to cardiac failure so ecmo receipt of ecmo and thrombosis risk um but yeah it's less than 3% and so it's a generally not a terrible condition if you think about sepsis uh, you know somebody with severe sepsis receiving inotropic support probably has a 20% risk of mortality 15 to 20% risk of mortality if they are in severe sepsis this is under 3% yeah you also asked whether uh, you had seen any meningitis or modern neuropathy like you know you know the other encephalopathy which you already mentioned yeah i don't think i've seen any mono neuropathies um and i suppose the aseptic meningitis maybe the encephalopathic presentations you know maybe part of it no aseptic viral meningoencephalitis we have I don't think that many of them are lp then they are all negative um, how common was uh, jaundice and transaminitis of chandela sast in public series yeah i don't know what your experience is jaundice i have never seen in a child with pims ts i think transaminitis is relatively common maybe you know every i don't know every three or four children that we see with pims ts have some elevation of liver enzymes but jaundice i have never seen in anybody yeah true even we have never seen i'm sure you've ever seen more numbers than us but we have never seen any pre jaundice uh narayan uh, sir i have a question Yeah. like uh, we have a couple of cases where we we got this uh, dengue positivity i mean ns1 positive along with uh, i mean this uh, pims but uh, the manifestation i mean the underlying if you see that the dengue like picture or the clinical manifestations they were not at all uh, seen in uh, those children it's more predominantly a shot of pims like picture but dengue came positive in couple of kids how to go about it Yeah, I mean, you asked me or Ram. Yeah, either of you can you now share your I, thoughts on that. I I haven't seen dengue in, other than in my father-in-law two years ago. I haven't seen <laughs> dengue in two years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, uh, if dengue comes positive, even we had a couple of cases where two of these things came positive, like dengue or scab typhus. But they had. So I think what we have been trying to see is that you know uh, we look at the markers. That's what I find me. If it is a uh, very high, like what Ram was mentioning, the feldin is above two thousand or you know the CRP is above hundred, two hundred, then we think it's more of uh, and of course the clinical status of the child. Dengue with uh, uh, all the uh, you know, uh, HLH and other things we have managed um, before. A lot of patients you know they have that uh, after fifth or sixth, seventh day they keep going down clinically and all that, and uh, so. i don't know i mean that's the research we don't know where it can be dengue or this thing but things which can help us would be the markers and the clinical status because treatment is i you know we are basically we have to say whether we can sit on him or we we need to give some even modulation so that will take with the clinical uh, uh, the uh, status of the patient as well as the markers yeah yeah we have seen like you said yeah. we have seen couple of patients who came positive serology for 
some of this tropical infection. Then what extra confusion which we have in our uh, place compared to what Ram or is not having there. We have a lot of our patients who are comes positive of multiple things. Then we have yeah, this confusion. Sure. I mean, I think essentially this is a sort of endothelial inflammation problem, isn't it? And I think rickettsial illnesses, meningococcal yeah. sepsis, they're all endothelial inflammation problem. And I think that's why there's so much overlap. And exactly as you say, where you have rickettsial diseases, it's even more complicated because you've got another reason for endothelial inflammation. Yeah, could we consider a plasma exchange in PIMS patient if it's not affordable for IVAG? Oh, I think plasma exchange might be more invasive um, in these patients because, um, I mean, I suppose technically, yes, you could do it. Um, but I think IVIG is probably the most non-invasive way of um, uh, managing this. Uh, you know, I suppose from a, from a theoretical perspective, yes, you know, you, you could do plasma exchange, but uh, I'm not sure that will be easy to do in many of these children who are not ventilated, don't have lines, et cetera, et cetera. This, I mean, we generally prefer plasma exchange when we want to remove some high levels of water antibodies, correct? I mean, I'm not sure that is the case here, no? Uh, it's high levels of inflammation. Uh, so, anti-inflammatory agents, steroids, and IV agents may be more effective. I'm not sure. And I, as you said, it is very highly invasive. The child who is in shock and cardiac dysfunction, doing this will be very challenging in most, in most settings, yeah. The other questions, some of them we already answered. Uh, do the children present an admission with severity like shock and what is the prognosis and mortality? Yeah, I think that we already addressed that question. Um, duration of, yeah, do you use regular albumin infusion in this patient as they have low to very low albumin? Yeah. It's usually very transient. We haven't used it. Um, for many patients, they usually get better, you know, soon. Within 24 hours, usually they start rising again. I think it just reflects the amount of endothelial leak of plasma protein, uh, and in the severe, the height of the inflammation. And then once the inflammation is, you know, either coming down or switched off, uh, the leak becomes less. So it's rare. Uh, we have, I have never used it. Um, most patients have been fine without. One or two patients have had significant edema from hypoalbuminemia, but it gets better um, after 24, 48 hours. I don't know if you've used albumin 20% or nothing. Uh, uh, no, no, no. We also never used it. Because, I mean, our, our explanation was similar to yours. The albumin just leaked out of the cells in Quebec. So, and they're all having cardiac failure. So maybe, yeah, we never used them. And we could easily manage them with uh, a little bit of fluid and anotropes. Anil has asked uh, the long term consequence of PIMS TS. I'm sure uh, that's a tricky question. Long term. Yeah, I mean, I think long term consequence is difficult. There are no data available. There is a long COVID study that's about to start in the UK. They're going to look at 600 children with and without COVID uh, to look at, and that will include PIMS TS patients, and look at them uh, and serially follow them up for uh, about one year to look for incidents of long COVID. Uh, I think uh, there isn't any currently any data. There is concern though that these PIMS-TS patients are now encephalopathic with not that much recovery and for several weeks. There are some patients who are significantly weak um, after PIMS-TS, whether that's the steroids, I'm not sure. But um, that may be something to think about because we are pumping them full of steroids, thinking that we are going to get them better but we may be causing a lot of myopathy and other complications of steroids um, that we don't know about. So short answer is we don't know, but we definitely need to find out. And he also asked a question about why we are seeing children around nine years. He's asking whether it's because they are the immunogenic phase of development. So is that the reason? Uh, I don't know. I think, uh, <laughs> no idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think we covered most of the questions. Uh, Lolam Venkates has again mentioned the same thing, but Dr. Khalil was saying uh, dengue febrile illness can mimic PIMS TS. Yeah, that's true. A lot of many tropical infections, dengue, strep typhus, maybe even uh, if, we, if we get even chikungunya and all this West Nile, maybe mimic them. How long do we need to continue that? We have to be answered. I think that's it. We have answered most of the questions.
Yeah, somebody, uh, Anna has asked if the patient at arrival is dyspneic and has crackles, do you still would go for the bolus or we can just give diuretics instead of uh, uh, fluids? Yeah, I think it's... Yeah, right. I mean, yeah. I would not give them bolus at that stage. If they are dyspneic and have crackles, then there's definitely acute lung injury and fluid. Um, I would not give them a bolus. I would treat them more for myocardial support. So they will probably need some myocardial support because that's why they have the crackles. Uh, and I think one or two patients, we have used diuretics to try and see uh, whether things get better, but it doesn't usually get quickly better. Uh, they continue to remain uh, tachypneic, um, probably because they are not necessarily fluid overloaded from congestive heart failure, but they are leaking from endothelial capillary leak. Uh, and so giving diuretics isn't really sort of helping too much. That's my experience. I, I've used it in a couple of patients. It hasn't really made a big difference. Yeah, I think you have answered most of the questions in the chat box. Yeah. Yeah, is there anything else Dr. Khalil or Dr. Nikhil wants to chip in and ask something? No, that, that's it. I think I am um, thank, thank, thank you for sparing this much of time. I think we have exceeded by more than 15 minutes. And okay. thank you. <laughs> and I think this is one of the most interesting discussions which I have ever attended. Uh, and a lot of questions have been answered. And thank you, thank, thanks a lot for sort of answering all the questions. Uh, I, I would sincerely thank uh, Ram sir and uh, Dr. Narayan sir for uh, taking out precious time to share their experience with all of us. Thank you, sir. Thank, thanks a lot. We'll end thank now. you, everybody. It's quite late for you. It's not too bad for yeah. me. So thank you yeah. for inviting me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ravi. It was nice meeting you and listening to you. Long time. <laughs>